Hello and welcome to Working Historians, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, Associate Dean for Liberal Arts for Southern New Hampshire University's online history programs. We're back. Apologies for the long delays between episodes lately. Let's just use pandemic as the excuse. I mean, we're all fine here in our remote wilderness retreat, but the world just refuses to be cool. Just be cool, world. Just be cool. Anyway, Jimmy and I are thrilled to talk to John Bertland, the digital librarian and content specialist for the Presidio Trust in San Francisco, California. In this episode, we talk about John's academic and professional background, his work at the Presidio Trust, and we end with a story about mules. Let's hear it. What is your name and what do you do? Hi, so my name is John Birdland, and I am the um, digital librarian and content specialist for the Presidio Trust. And uh, if you don't know what the Presidio Trust is, and there's a fair chance you don't, it's the federal agency uh, that manages the Presidio San Francisco, which is a former, or most of the Presidio San Francisco, which is a former uh, U.S. Army base, uh, which is now part of the National Park Service. It's a unit of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So, John, can you tell us a little bit about your background? One, how you became interested in uh, history as a topic through your uh, your library your library studies, and um, how you be uh, how you came to be at the Presidio. Um, yeah, I, my, my interest in history goes back a while, um, and I, I, I majored in um, European diplomatic history uh, as an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, and then did very little with that. Uh, years later, I got a, a library degree, a master's of library science, and uh, as, you know, as, as, a, as a few decades on seeking a new career. And uh, how I ended up at the Presidio is kind of a roundabout way. Um, my, one of my first uh, library jobs uh, while I was still in, in, in library graduate school uh, was helping to set up a nonprofit library for a nonprofit center run by Tides uh, in the Presidio. So the Presidio, most of the many of the uh, historic buildings there. Uh, are now leased out to you know, offices, re- tenants, residents uh, to raise money to keep the, the park and the park facilities going. So, um, and that, that nonprofit center was located in Letterman Hospital uh, or the old Letterman Hospital buildings. And just by working there in that project, I got to know staff at the Presidio Trust. I got to know the librarian at the Presidio Trust. And I did that uh, story you sometimes hear of volunteering, which then leads to a job. So uh, that does happen. So I volunteered with her, and then when um, they needed extra help, they installed a, a, the trust installed a digital asset management system. Uh, I was hired to uh, help do that cataloging and management, and then it and then I um, just kept doing other <laughs> sort of related jobs uh, for the trust. But one of those was. Um, we the trust uh, rehabilitated the historic uh, presidio officers club uh, parts of which go back to the uh, when it was uh, spanish and the mexican colony the presidio was uh, originally established in 1776 we can talk about that some more later um but uh part of that was creating a uh, set of permanent a, a permanent history exhibition uh in uh, a portion of the officers club so i was hired to do some research for that some content development for that and especially i'm um, hunting up uh photographs new historical photographs so uh yeah so i supported that work which gave me a rather sort of quick uh or intense introduction to presidio history uh and um not long after that the librarian retired so i i slipped into her position more or less and continued to do that that digital asset management work. We have a small physical collection, um, but then also, uh, yeah, working to help other sort of information management functions within within the trust now. But history is the most important, most most interesting part. <laughs> well, and that's those are two perfect connections. So the the Letterman Hospital and what you do um, at the Presidio. You recently published an article uh, with uh, Barbara Sokolov. Letterman General Hospital during World War One. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you became interested in the topic and how you started uh, collaborating with Barbara? 
Yeah, that's it's a curious story. And what really happened there was, um, A, I was just interested in the history of Letterman General Hospital having, um, you know, worked in that building, even if it wasn't a hospital anymore. And also there's not much, um, you know, there, 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 there's nothing really academic written about it. There's not much in way of um, interpretation or anything written about the history of the place, except pointing out that it was, you know, in World War II, the major disembarkation hospital for wounded soldiers uh, returning from the Pacific Theater in World War II, I, you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. So, you know, it's a major uh, World War II location within San Francisco. And just looking at it today, you know, it's 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 a sleepy set of offices. Um, uh, so you, you would have absolutely no sense that you probably have no sense it was a hospital, but no sense that there's this that much activity there. So I was kind of curious about the history of the place. Uh, but then also uh, in my general uh, searching around for new historical, new historical photographs, newly scanned historical photographs, always of the Presidio and, and associated uh, sites. And, uh, and, the, and Letterman Hospital is located within the Presidio. That, that, I, I hope I made that clear, but it's, it, it, that's the, these different posts and subposts can be confusing. But um, what I saw was that uh, the National Archives and Records Administration uh, had digitized a lot of photos of Letterman and also Presidio activities uh, during World War One. Really, uh, sorry, to coincide with Centennial, um, NARA did a fantastic job, really, of digitizing and putting online in their catalog a lot of World War One uh, related World War One photos from the U.S. Army, U.S. Uh, US Army Signal Corps, especially. So. Um, that, 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 that's sort of an amazing thing they've done. And so I was, um, sitting, sitting on all these photos, uh, and others from elsewhere and some other, uh, you know, a few other research and, uh, resources. And, uh, we got to, yeah, and I, uh, uh, when did I decide to do like, uh, you know, we got to the centennial of the U S and world war one, you know, a few years ago. Uh, 2017, 2018. And so I uh, just thought I'd to do as you know, a little hobby, a little side project. I um, offered to then the, the nonprofit center at what was Letterman Hospital. Uh, they, they have gallery space that they rotate things in and out of. And I was friends with the people who run that still. And so I offer, you know, or suggest asked, well, yeah, asked if I could do this little historical exhibition using the photos and other materials uh and yeah they were and you know they were they were fine with that and so i put that together uh which then became a much larger project than i originally thought but you know it was uh, uh, um, you, 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 a bit homespun you know with printed out photos on phone core and things like that but uh, uh but i what i added to that then uh because that year i was also traveling to Baltimore for a conference. So I knew I was going to be in the DC area. And so I arranged to spend a few days at the National Archives to sort of try to, you know, and plus I was just sort of, I've worked with archives a lot locally and, you know, primary sources and such. And so that's always fun. But here is an opportunity and a reason to go to the, the National Archives and hunt up Letterman Hospital records from World War I correspondence and reports and things. And uh, so I so I grabbed that opportunity, and that was uh, uh, one of these situations. And you probably hear of this more and more, where I was just there for a few days, photographing as many pieces of paper and photographs and maps as I possibly could, and then you know processing all that in the coming months uh, and, and 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 longer. So that is so it was really amazing how much stuff. Uh, I could vacuum up. Anybody could now go go vacuum up with their um, camera or their 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 phone camera, and so yeah, was, I grabbed a lot of that correspondence and details, and so that really helped me then flesh out uh, the exhibition. I had some you know more sort of personal detail about people and uh, particular events, and uh, then also combined that. And of course now you know with all the newspapers that have been digitized. Um, starting to do that research so anyway i did that little exhibition uh and it was cool because and yeah i didn't have any artifacts but i had but it was in part of the building that was there during world war one 
So that was kind of cool. And it was mostly for the tenants there. So they got a, you know, they got a kick out of it, seeing what their building looked like and, you know, patients and, you know, lying out in the hallways or in, in, or in office spaces now. So, uh, so that was fun. But then um, a year after that, um, I think this is the time I write. Anyway, all blurs together. But um, yeah, about a year after that, the editor of California History uh, from, UC, from UC Press, uh, Marianne Irwin, uh, contacted Barbara Berglund Sokolov, the, the co-author of the article, uh, who at the time was the historian for the Presidio Trust. And um, Marianne Irwin was interested in putting together a themed issue of California history about California in World War I, because there has not been a lot written about or thought about California in World War I. So she was eager to do that. And, uh, and the, the, she originally wanted a fast turnaround. So uh, she reached out to Barbara because she knew Barbara, and then Barbara reached out to me because she knew I was sitting on all this research and the start of an article, and so it seemed reasonable that we could put together uh, an article for that. Now, that dragged on for like a year. year it, the, the issue didn't come out uh, or didn't get put together in time for uh, when Marianne wanted it, so it, uh, it, came out, it came out eventually last year, a little after our anniversaries, but um, it did come out, so got more time to work on it, um, did more uh newspaper research and article research and flesh out some things so um yeah and it was fun working with barbara uh we're friends and uh yeah so the, so the bulk of the research is mine and then we co-wrote it uh she she has a phd in history she has a little you know a background in cultural history and social history so she was able to bring a lot of that that writing and academic experience and perspective that you know i wouldn't have had uh, in it, and we hammered, hammered that article out together, um, and there it is. That's very cool. The yeah, the story of going to the archives and taking photos of every document. That's how basically how I did my dissertation a while back. <laughs> and so, I spent two weeks at the Reagan Presidential Library in uh, Simi Valley, and came back with something like eight or 10,000 photos that of course I then had to spend the next six months <laughs> sorting through and trying to, try to categorize them and make an outline identifying where each, uh, where each of those images were so I could go find them later. And it, it's when you're, when you're doing it, you're like, Hey, this is really cool. Click, 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 click. And then you realize that you took, when you get home that you have way too much stuff to get through. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but hopefully I'll go out there and, and do some more. So. Yeah, it's fun to do. So as the um, librarian for the uh, Presidio Trust, you're, you were talking about how you do the digital content. Um, where are, so it sounds, so obviously you're, you're kind of searching for some of that content on your own by doing research in other archives. You said you were looking online to find uh, various digital sources. Are you, or is the, is the Presidio creating its own Basically, is it digitizing its own records? Is that the type of stuff that you're talking about? Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm involved in both aspects of that. Um, so we, so, yeah, so we maintain a digital library, a digital asset management system, which includes uh, both historical photos, records, documents, and also our current. Uh, more uh, photos and uh, videos and related things, not as much on the document side, except for printed reports. Um, and then so the, the actual so, uh, uh, part of it is um, we're, we're not ourselves a collecting institution, so we don't have our own archives, um, although there's a caveat to that, say that, talk to that in a moment. But, um, but there is an archives managed by the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Uh, of which we are a part. And so that's a large national park unit uh, extending, I don't know how far, north and south of the Bay Area. But that also includes historical sites that you might have heard of, like Alcatraz, um, and then other ar uh, army posts that were in the Bay Area, the Cliff House, which is a popular um, San Francisco destination. And so all the, the responsibility for those 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 documents that are still in the Bay Area are there, you, and artifacts, uniforms, and things like that. Most of the Army records, the vast majority of the Army records, have ended up with the National Archives, which is why I have to go out to D.C. to kind of do this this sort of research. 
Um, and then we do have an archaeology program, uh, a very active archaeology program that uh, and, and they what they discover, they uh, have their own collection where they manage uh, those artifacts and care for those. Uh, the Brazil and, and so we 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 do we're, we're working no one wants to hear that much about our internal records management and information management at, <laughs> at, at the moment probably but yeah you know we're we're, we're, we're doing more all digital uh we're working on getting that internally better organized better managed digitizing some things um and so i, I touched that but uh a bit too but um uh yeah the history is the more more fun stuff and I'm getting to, and yeah, I would get some of that um, from archives, especially low, there is still a lot of fascinating material in local archives and in California, but um, less of that uh, with the pandemic. But it's also, um, I just amazing, uh, fortunately, uh, all the digitization projects that are going on around the country, because that makes life so much easier for me uh, to find that stuff uh, that would otherwise be hidden. Um, when I say, you know, I mentioned that you know, army records are then in, in, in D.C. mostly, uh, the fact of the Presidio being an army base, uh, people would be there for a few weeks, maybe a few years, and then they would go somewhere else. So all these soldiers, officers, family, civilian employees, their records, if they kept any, their records and their photographs are scattered at you know, universities and historical societies and whatnot around the country. So, you know, uh, the more that that's digitized, the more I can find. And it's pretty easy to, you know, keyword search them. Presidio San Francisco, when you find a new, when you find a new repository or Letterman or other, other parts of the Presidio. So, so I'm always, always looking for that. Nice. John, one thing I'd like to hear a little bit more about is we've talked to a lot of historians on here and we talk about primary sources and we talk about research and and the different types of sources that they engage with. But I don't think that we've ever spoken to somebody whose research is so connected to visual media. And I'd hmm. love to hear a little bit more about how you use that because re just the way you talk about your research, reading your article, um, the images themselves aren't supplements to the history. They're, they seem to be actually the documents that you pull from and the inspiration for the history. So I'd love to hear how you um, go about utilizing images and how you connect it to um, other text-based research. Yeah. Um, well, a lot just by virtue of being a librarian and managing uh, my digital asset management system, um, a, a lot of that is thinking about how you know thinking about how to describe images and how to categorize them um so that you can find them later so i've I've got a fairly and i'm always tweaking it but i've got a fairly elaborate taxonomy uh for photos that are found I mean, and we have now got like almost ten thousand historical photos it's actually quite surprising wow. some of them are extremely boring just building photos but <laughs> anyway so but so working with that uh yeah just always thinking about you know what if i want to find this image later especially but also helping other people find it what what is it in the photograph that's significant what's interesting um as you get as i get to you know more of a, a subject knowledge of the presidio and letterman and um you know Fort Scott, Fort Winfield Scott, which is another part of the Presidio and Christie Field. Uh, you know, you start to notice other things and, you know, like I'm getting better at different airplanes or different guns and things like that, which is stuff you want to uh, bring out. So, uh, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, you're always, you know, I'm looking for, and, and, and I get asked for photo recommendations. So, yeah, I'm always thinking about, you know, those photos that, reveals, yeah, something in, there's information in that photo that reveals something. Uh, or that you can say something about uh, that you wouldn't necessarily get just from the text or something like that. And uh, and especially with the Presidio, it's interesting that you've got um, a lot of it is still there and historically preserved, but a lot of it is not. So that's also can be very interesting in its own way. Um, a lot of those uh, Letterman photos that I use in the article are parts of the hospital that were eventually uh, eventually torn down. 
Um, so that then becomes really sort of the only way to, you know, bring this part of the Presidio back to life or get a sense of its use or its design or things like that. But um, yeah, so I'm always, I'm, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm always looking at uh, photos, historical photographs with that, you know, with that taxonomy, with the taxonomy development uh, in mind. And so you said you had that, uh, um, you have an anthropology uh, program going there. Are they archaeology? Archaeology, sorry. Yeah, they've got an archaeology program going. And so, <laughs> are they um, are they still like physically trying to like ex excavate certain areas of the Presidio? Uh, what is what is that group up to? Yes, they are. It's an active uh, ongoing. I think it's the largest active uh, archaeology project in the West, or maybe the largest active public archaeology, but it is, it's ongoing. Where they're focused on now, um, a little more Presidio background, uh, the Presidio of San Francisco was uh, established by the Spanish Empire in 1776, so the northernmost north outpost of the Spanish Empire, um, to secure uh, San Francisco Bay, which was a known, a known quantity at that point, uh, to secure that against uh, especially the Russians, but possibly also the British. So uh, the Spanish uh, Empire ordered an expedition uh, of about 200 settlers from uh, northern Mexico, mostly from Sonora and Sinaloa, uh, led by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Juan Bautista de, Ana, de Anza, sorry, uh, who, who led them, they walked, marched up the, the coast and settled El Presidio there. And it was, and so that's, that's the birth of um, the Presidio and really the birth of San Francisco because it's the start of uh, this European settlement, this Western settlement. And so uh, it started as a little quadrangle, I think about, uh, about 300 feet square. And then that got expanded a few decades later. And so what our uh, archeologists are really focused on right now is uh, finding exactly where the foundations of that original quadrangle construction, uh, that original qu quadrangle wall, which was usually only three walls, but still in a quadrangle shape. And so they've just um, they've uh, just expanded their dig, uh, trying to precisely place the northwest corner of it. And we have a good we have a good sense of where the original foundations are. A because part of it still exists uh, in the building that's now the officers' club. So the army kept parts of this uh, you know, Spanish period uh, foundations and adobe walls uh, as walls in the officers' club. Um, but then also uh, when the army first occupied the Presidio in 1847, you know, they did, the, 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 it was in a state of disrepair, but they occupied what buildings were left. And then as it expanded, especially with the Civil War um, in this area that we now call the main post, the, um, the army just expanded along the same lines. So you can kind of look at the map and see where the original Presidio settlement is. Um, but the precise details of the foundations and uh, materials of the foundations and things that might be buried next, you know, because you always got garbage pits near there, and archaeologists love that. So they're actively working on that. Um, before that, which is quite interesting, and when I say the army built around it, a lot of the, their focus the past few years has been one wall or one section where the army did in the um, 1880s uh, build uh, new officers' housing around the existing adobe walls. And that all collapsed during the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. So it is interesting to see because you've got these layers of, you know, the, the Spanish era foundation and then adobe material and then army era bricks scattered on top of it from having collapsed. And so that, so the, so their archaeology does extend throughout the whole, the whole history of, of the post. And they also get to, you know, they also just pull things out of walls, which is always fun because soldiers would just stick things. <laughs> alcohol bottles, uh, contraceptive wrappers, things like that. They would just stick that in the in gaps in the walls. So, they, so that's that's all considered archaeology. It's good fun. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 good stuff. And so the yeah, so the Presidio has evolved considerably over time. And I I'm originally from California and spent plenty of time in San Francisco. The um, 
Presidio, I mean, I spent probably more time at Fort Point than anywhere else in the uh, in the Presidio. But oh, yeah. uh, we did, did drive through there a few times, and it looks like a really interesting place and it's a beautiful place. And um, so I'm a little, I'm you know, I'm only slightly jealous that you get to work there every day. Well, remotely most of the time now, but we'll. Well, we'll right. <laughs> we're, we're working you'll, on it. <laughs> yeah, you'll get there. <laughs> um, so I, you bring up a really, I love this conversation about both archaeology, but also the changing architecture, because one of the things that Presidio does really well is reuse of space. And it's like, re, it, they don't necessarily tear down. It's more revitalization, but recreation of um of traditional army spaces for to make things like the inn um Mm -hmm. and the letterman hospital is a great example of that because it's now uh office buildings which is super interesting um but going back to the history and the article what i found really fascinating is when you think about world war one and you think about technical technological advancements um Mm taught a lot of world history and most of the things that we focus on happen in the European theater. So we're talking about um, the mass use of machine guns, barbed wire, trench warfare. Um, What I found really interesting about your article was some of the other technological um, advancements that happened in the States as a result of medicine, one being, um, so the Letterman leg, for example, Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's a, a great example, but also I didn't realize that the the design of the hospital itself became a model for how other military hospitals were um, were developed after that. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting part of the story. That um, uh, yeah, that yeah, you know, with World War One, Letterman Hospital then sort of gets reproduced around the country. Um, because of the design of the hospital. And the design actually goes back um, to the Civil War and to to Jonathan Letterman. So the Letterman Hospital is named after Jonathan Letterman. Uh, He was medical director of the Army of the Potomac uh, of the US between 1862 and 1864 during the Civil War. And he was best known for um, creating a system of, of, of uh, professional prompt battlefield evacuation of, unit, of, of wounded in battle and creating a professional dedicated ambulance corps um, to do that, where it had all been a bit ad hoc before. So he's, he's there and the practices he instituted or, or created are still, uh, still in form uh army medical practice today so important figure but uh, he also uh, he, he also influenced hospital design and that's uh, and um it was at that point the army selected this pavilion design for hospitals which you don't really see anymore um and so i, I don't know how many examples are out there but um the pavilion design then uses these narrow rectangular wards and in letterman's case it's uh, it's it was five yeah five wards uh on each uh, four wards on each side of this quadrangle and then administration in the front and support in the back um and so the idea was it's easier to manage these separate wards but then it also provided more light and more ventilation which at the time was all all believed to be um uh good for re- recovery and uh yeah when when it was built so it was built in um, 1899 and they used that design. And then when um, World War One broke out, or when the U.S. entered World War One, uh, there were, as, as I point out in the article, when the war broke out, there were only four general hospitals in the army, um, and only two of those were truly general, and that was Letterman and Walter Reed. So they looked at you know the, the, the plans that existed, and they used that to reproduce. Again, they built I think they built about forty general and base hospitals. Uh, around the country, but of course, I've, hospital designs changed since then. Um, but it's still, uh, yeah, you can you can see it there. And then, um, yeah, the Letterman leg. Uh, and yes, I, yeah, to, one one of the reasons I was really interested in um, doing the research on Letterman and World War One and doing the article um, was because, like I said, not much had been written about Letterman Hospital. And uh, except people did like to bring up the Letterman leg because, you know, it, it's alliterative, so it must be important. 
Um, but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but details are few. And I always, always say, well, what's really going on here? Uh, and then also that the, the, another aspect that really made it interesting, uh, made this period in Letterman and World of Wonder interesting to me uh, was that, uh, yeah, once I found out all this stuff happened, you know, it, it was a very busy place during World War One, And, uh, you know, wounded soldiers were actually being brought back from Europe. Uh, to be treated there. And I, uh, I just got that sense that, well, you know, people, America, uh, A, Americans don't think much about World War I at all anyway. Um, but certainly in San Francisco and California, you think of it as something that happened over there, way over there, other side of the planet. And so to all of a sudden discover that, you know, Letterman was this major hive of activity, uh, wounded soldiers coming from San Francisco. I thought that was a very interesting hook. I thought that could get people's attention. Um, but yeah, the, where, where the Letterman leg does come in, Cerveza relate, it, it's interesting, it eventually connects to um, the fact that San Francisco was still kind of distanced from the center of things at that point. And um, to uh, d- d- brief context with, with World War I, when the U.S. Army entered, um, the Army looked at the medical department under Surgeon General Gorgas, looking at the experience of other powers in, you know, who had been fighting the war for years, saw that there were new types of severe wounds to, to limbs uh, yeah, and, and amputation of limbs, uh, broken arms, and that there was a need for more focus on orthopedic surgery, uh, more focus on, on amputees and creating uh, appliances for them. So that was all really fairly new to the U.S. Army. Um, and they, uh, so they, they studied the European experience and they, it took them about a year to sort of figure out what, what to do, but they eventually created this system of expanded orthopedics and uh, a physical rehabilitation program. And the Army explicitly committed itself to what um, the Surgeon General called a, a program of maximum rehabilitation, where the Army was now promising that uh, men injured uh, in battle or in service uh, would be treated and also uh, rehabilitated, that is to say, educated or trained to be fully functioning members of society after they left the Army. And this was a total change from views of um, you know army obligation to the injured before the war and uh, and there are other other dimensions to that but that's what creates this orthopedic service and that then changes um, that impact uh, impacts uh, Letterman Hospital and that you know it has to create its orthopedic service it has to create its appliance shop um, and this, it all it's 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 it, it, this is particularly fun to read about in the correspondence and memories because it's like you know the, this appliance shop of creating you know it's not just our full of show, legs and arms but also splints and uh, especially um, aids uh, you know, shoe uh, inserts uh, for flat feet and so on um, it starts out in a little basically a shed which is described as a fire hazard in the back of the hospital and it gradually um, expands uh, and uh, created by uh, Robert Hall gets it uh, going. And then the appliance shop sort of gets going um, really toward the end of the war, uh, November or October 1918. But then he brings in uh, Major Leo L. Wesser, who is a very interesting uh, figure. He brings uh, Leo L. Wesser in to take over specifically the appliance shop and the amputation service. Um, and Leo L. Wesser is interesting. He's a San Franciscan, but he was educated. His ed- medical education was in Germany, and um, but he came back to to practice in uh, San Francisco. And he was at uh, I think at this point he, he he worked with the UCSF and then also Stanford. I think he was at Stanford when the war broke out. And he specialized in orthopedics and uh, other related fields. But when the war broke out, he went back to Germany, to his medical school in Germany. So in 1915, 1916, he is actually treating German, you know, before the U.S. enters the war, he is treating uh, German soldiers uh, from a variety of wounds. So really one of the few doctors in the United States at this point that can be said to have any experience 
uh, with medical service in, in, in World War I. He comes back in 1916 because it's looking increasingly like the U.S. will enter the war. And then um, he, he volunteers for the Medical Reserve uh, uh, Corps before the war. And they, they, he's in it, but they don't, uh, uh, they don't appoint him anywhere. Um, and then when the war breaks out, he tries again, and it becomes clear that he's not being given a position, uh, even though he's eminently qualified, because of this German connection. And the army is nervous, or some specific, he doesn't name them, but there are people within the army who don't want to give him a, a position because they suspect his loyalty. But by November, the head of um, orthopedics at Letterman Hall recognizes L. Wester's usefulness and puts him in charge of the amputation service and, and amputee shop. And um, I don't have, uh, Ella, as Ella Wessler remembers it, he has this funny story in his, uh, that, that's repeated in his biography that he, he went to the commanding officer of, the, of Letterman, Northington, uh, and with a request for like two, two or three thousand dollars worth of new equipment. And Northington just looked at him and said, well, that's not going to get you anything. Ask for twenty five thousand. Uh, ask for 30 things. <laughs> so I, I haven't found uh, corroboration of that. But a month after LOS or took over, the um, monthly allotment that uh, the uh, for orthopedic materials that the hospital was getting was tripled from 500 to 1500. So that was materials, parts, and things. So he did something, he got more money uh, somehow. But then, uh, we, and so he came into. Um, he came into the hospital with definite ideas about orthopedics or definite, definite ideas about uh, orthopedics and about um, artificial legs and how they should be designed. And there's still, you know, a lot of debate at that time uh, about artificial legs, artificial arms, best design and so on. I, I suspect there still is today. Um, but uh, and uh, he, he, he especially uh without getting into too much detail about technology, but especially a uh, favorite and was an advocate for uh, end bearing uh, loads and a most, uh, you know, sort of putting more pressure on the end of an amputated uh, limb. Uh, most people were more interested or, or, or focused more on braces and, and so on, so like that. So he was in a bit of a minority. Um, anyway, the, the army at the, at the medical department level, uh, realizing that they were going to be getting back thousands of uh, wounded men, possibly tens of thousands, who knows how many, requiring artificial limbs, uh, looked into how they could create a, a more mass-produced temporary leg, which eventually became the Liberty leg. Um, and it was made out of vulcanized fiber. And you know, it, 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 it was somewhat ridiculous. Before that, um, before this, you know, you would, uh, in our artificial legs, they would be individually crafted, essentially. Um, and so you couldn't, there, there weren't, intended to be mass produced, but the army was looking to see it. So, well, how, what, what can we do with that? And there's, remember, this is also, you know, in the middle of the, or toward the end of the progressive era, people always looking for efficiency and expertise and trying to rationalize that process. So um, the medical department through experiments settled on this, this, this um, Liberty leg uh, of lighter material than traditional things. And it had some adjustments, but it was always meant as temporary and so on. And, um, and it's funny at Letterman, and so, but these were all made on the East Coast. And there's this, um, so now in this period after LOS or just before you know, LOS takes over, there begins this sort of Kafka esque correspondence as Letterman's trying to order, is trying to get these legs or get the, and their arms as well, trying to get these appliances. And they're just, they're sent, they're not sent, the, the postage is wrong. And so eventually they never get to Letterman. Um, so, so taking that Letterman's having to challenge getting these medical, these basic medical supplies appliances, combined with Ella Wesser and his own ideas, uh, he, he fashions what becomes known as the Letterman leg, uh, which is more less mass produced. It has that end bearing uh, character that uh, Ella Wesser advocated. And uh, they just, they got permission. They got permission from the medical department to, you know, go off on their own, make their own legs, as long as they didn't talk about it too much. 
um, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, there, you know, they, 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 there is somewhere LOS or apparently did a final report extolling their virtues that uh, doesn't seem to exist anymore. But um, but it does creep. But the Letterman link did creep out into the newspaper, local chronicle and national newspapers. Uh, and so so the army must have proved that at some level. Uh, one of the most interesting examples of that is um, there's a ser- there's an article that was re- from 1919 that was reproduced across the country about Lillard Evans, uh, who was an African American enlisted man who had gotten two Letterman legs, uh, and uh, you know, and, and and could do and could dance the foxtrot on them. This was the story. So this is really a nice little propaganda story for army rehabilitation, um, army orthopedics, artificial limbs, and Letterman. And um, he was described, Lillard Evans was described as having lost both his legs uh, while fighting in France. That part wasn't true. Uh, he, he was in the uh, 25th Infantry, one of the what's known as the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, African-American segregated units that were not actually sent to France. He was in a car accident in Hawaii. Uh, and sent to Letterman, but he did, he did get, you know, he did get two uh, Letterman legs. I don't know if he could dance the Foxtrot, but that was the story. He went on to live a long, um, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a happy life, but, you know, he, he ran a boarding house, he got married twice. So uh, he did exist and did, um, had the legs, but um, yeah, so, so, so this Letterman leg was created. It was probably a good design. It had no real impact outside of uh, Letterman is the thing uh so it's it's historically interesting and it, it shows a lens on the hospital and uh, san francisco and, and and letterman uh during world war one but uh the it, it, like it, it 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 doesn't have much influence on its own although later on uh he's vindicated uh as new uh, especially with world war ii in korea the army adopts uh, a design more like the letterman like you know from from other research and so on um, but we know we, 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 uh, we have some sense that people did like the Letterman leg because um, the army intended all these appliances, these artificial legs to be temporary. And then you would go to the um, uh, Bureau of War Risk Insurance and go through this bureaucratic nightmare to get your, your permanent leg. And from reports uh, at Letterman in the 20s, they, 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 you know, in the years after the war, they are getting people coming back. Uh, to get their Letterman leg fixed, rather than have to get what is considered, a, 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 you know, what what what's considered a state of the art leg elsewhere. Um, and uh, a, another interesting footnote there to that is um, the that they hired uh, to run to to really the the civilian they hired to do like a lot of the crafts work at the appliance shop is a man named Joseph Maria Mar- or Maria. Uh, and so he started in 1918. And so he was the one doing a lot, you know, a lot of the basic work, making Letterman legs and other appliances and so on. He was there at Letterman doing that job until at least 1942. So he doing that same work and still and they were still calling it the Letterman leg at that point uh, when World War Two breaks out. So it might have been, you know, niche and local to California. But, uh, you know, with Maria, you've got that. It's interesting that you've got that, that consistency of knowledge that experience that then goes straight into uh, World War II from from World War One. Wow, I don't know what I um, like more about that story: the fact that you speak in footnotes, or you found a way to throw Franz Kafka into a, a history discussion. Both, <laughs> both make me very happy. <laughs> is, is it most army correspondence Kafka esque, or any time you get the government <laughs> uh, bureaucratic uh, things? <laughs> So uh, you you ended there by talking about kind of moving a little bit into like the World War II. You mentioned uh, Korea there where, I mean, those wars, it feels like the Presidio would be more, you know, geographically strate- and strategically placed uh, for those other conflicts for World War II, the Korea, um, than it did during World War One, where, again, not all, but the a bulk of the fighting was happening in uh, in Europe. And so, you know, the Presidio is kind of on the wrong end of the continent for that. But uh, what did you see or how did the Presidio evolve during the uh, World War II and then into the Cold War? Um, 
what happened? It's interesting. Yeah, it's a, that's a, to your first point. That is sort of interesting about World War One. That actually so much did happen at the Presidio and Letterman and, and Fort Winfield Scott. It's sort of a surprise there. And there, and what and briefly what that speaks to is just that World War One was this massive national mobilization of people and society and culture and the economy that I think that we've forgotten about. Um, but yeah, yeah, when you get, and 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 it's also interesting. Uh, regarding World War One, so, uh, Le- Letterman's transformed, and those transformations continue on into uh, the interwar period, and uh, and so as you know, the orthopedic service becomes permanent. They add new services for eye, ear, nose, and throat, um, for uh, neuropsychiatric ne- neurosurgery. Um, they're treating more veterans, which is a new thing um, that because. The, the government the U- made promises of treatment uh, to injured soldiers, uh, independent of the medical department, but then it didn't have the infrastructure in place. So Letterman has to, and other army hospitals are taking them in. Um, with, the, w- with the Presidio and the other major part of the Presidio is Fort Winfield Scott, which is the coastal defense, the coastal batteries. World War I sort of shows the writing on the wall for both of these um, for both of both of these posts, because with World War One, it's clear you need for training you need massive area, you know, a massive area. The 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 cantonments that were created, I think, it hold what twelve thousand people, something like that. Presidio cannot hold and train that many, so it had some. Oh, it was busy. It had some officers training camps and, and some regiments, um, but it's clear that you know with, as the future would go on, it would not be a major training center. And with Fort Winfield Scott, it's sort of clear, you know the battleships are getting better and larger guns more quickly than the coastal defenses can be upgraded. Um, and so it's, that's, that's sort of a coming question. Um, so when World War II does happen, yeah, that the coastal defense function is still significant. Uh, you've now got some larger 16 inch guns there and you've got smaller rapid fire guns that will provide, but the, um, but the first line of defense now, it, what was always the Navy, but now you've got aviation as well. So, if any Japanese ships were to get that close to San Francisco, it's sort of, you'd, you were, you'd be in a bad situation anyway. And then with the um, with the Presidio, by that point, um, when, when World War II breaks out, and a few years before World War II breaks out, it becomes, or really right after World War I, it becomes a headquarters post. It becomes its primary function. Uh, so it's the headquarters of the Ninth Corps area, which is responsible for troops and training uh, across the West. By World War by World War II, this has been reorganized into it's the headquarters of the Western Defense Command and Fourth Army. So it's, in, it's the headquarters of this Fourth Army unit, and then with Western Defense Command, defending the entire West Coast up through Alaska. So it's more of a now you know it's more of that top level planning administrative function than it is sort of your your training or or training. Whereas in the Spanish American War or Civil War, you train troops and deploy them. Now it's this uh, this administrative function, and then Letterman's still huge in World War II, and that kind of that's basic that that largely describes the Presidio afterwards uh, in in the post World War II era um, in uh, in the Korean War. You know, its primary role uh, is its headquarters of the Sixth Army, so it's training and preparing. Uh, troops for Korea, but once they get sent to Korea, you know, both army and national guard troops are for Korea. But once it's over, the, once they're over there, you know, it's an, it's an entirely different command. The sixth army is still very focused on um, uh, defending the United States, defending the continental United States. And there's even some, and so speaking of writing on the wall, uh, there's even some correspondence from, I think it's 1944, 19, yeah, probably 1944, uh, even at that point, the army is considering, uh, it sort of realizes that the Presidio is superfluous to, to immediate need. It's, you know, it's, it's some office space and um, they don't, it's not that important. And there are people from, there are officers from Letterman who are, who are literally in Presidio buildings, you know, measuring for drapes. There's this proposal that, well, okay, you get rid of the Presidio and just annex it all to, to Letterman Hospital. Um, that didn't happen, but it was certainly something uh, that was being thought about at the time. Great. And um, so Jimmy has been kind of 
the, the, the teaser for all of our conversations where we were uh, thinking about bringing you on is Jimmy kept talking about this story that he wants to hear about mules. And I never quite understood what, <laughs> what Jimmy was talking about. So I'm going to let Jimmy take over and, and, and let you guys get, go, get into this story because I, I, I keep hearing about it, but I don't have any idea what, what, what's actually happening with that. I, you know, I think this is a great way to close off uh, the conversation too, because um, I, I just find this every time I read something that you share about the Presidio mules, John, it's just, it makes me laugh and I absolutely love it. So if you could bring us home with a conversation about Presidio mules, that would be fantastic. You don't hear that very often. Bring us no. home with a story about mules. <laughs> Ah, oh, so many is true. Sir. No, and I think that's um, uh, f- f- finding out about meals. And that was, you know, that was uh, in general that was something interesting to me to think about at the Presidio. That um, at times you had hundreds of mules and hundreds of horses, and when you're there today, you know, it's a very well manicured landscape, somewhat quiet, uh, pleasant experience to be. And to, so to think about massive herds. Of, of, of and cattle, you know, mass herds of livestock and mules and things. And, you know, that was it was very much a daily life of the post throughout the 19th century into the early 20th century. So I find that fascinating. And I'm, I, 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 well, I don't know about fascinating, but it's interesting at least. And I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it, was, it would surprise people when they do hear it. But you do get the occasional, of course, mules are, of course, mules are, are, are difficult uh to work with and uh actually one of the uh, and so there if stories get out there i'm always looking for more one of the most fame maybe the presidio's most famous mule uh was the duke of wellington uh and so they some of them have names yes so they're especially have names uh and so um the duke of wellington uh was known for being especially disagreeable uh, and, oh, as I'm, I'm looking, so this, and, and I get all this from newspapers, so thankfully people digitize newspapers, but the Duke, um, apparently was known for, uh, uh, a, 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 a very, a very successful habit of lifting up both hanging legs and with a graceful motion, throwing any rider off the ground and on to, you know, off the saddle and onto the ground. Um, he also liked to, uh, kick, kick planks out of the sides of barns. But um, he was uh, he was uh, retired in 1912, uh, late 1912, uh, and uh, so he auctioned off to do and basically have a quiet life of um, you know hauling a garbage cart. Um, but then a few years later, uh, he got tired of that. Uh, ditched the cart at some point and returned to the Presidio uh, wearing just you know, sections of the jump car. So minus the cart and driver. Uh, so he, he had obviously missed uh, his service in the Presidio and just decided to come back there. Um, I also, oh yeah, the, an early, another earlier story about the Duke is that when he was uh, hauling equipment at Fort Mason, when they were doing that construction around 19, 1912, he just got bored and decided to roll down the embankment uh, with his cart uh, into the bay. Um, and and uh, he enjoyed that. He came out, he came out swimming. <laughs> um, but then there's also, I think this is one I showed Jimmy recently. Yeah, Marguerite, uh, the mule, again, about that time. And I, it, I, I should double check. All these stories might be from the same quartermaster, which would then make it. A suspect but uh marguerite was left alone it was a good well-behaved mule um but uh he was left alone on the main post one day when everybody was off training and so there weren't much guard weren't many people there and then a uh, blast went off in one of the presidio quarries there were several uh, quarries there for uh, stone for making roads and all that and this is about three in the afternoon but um since it sounded to marguerite like the sunset gun like the gun that's fired when uh, you know it's it's time to uh, lower the flag. Uh, he he saw that it didn't come down and went over, untie and as like any good American would, uh, 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 un- grabbed the lanyards, uh, un- somehow untied it with his teeth, and got the the, the flag down. So. <laughs> 
Uh, they're, they're devoted, you know, so many devoted uh, creative mules at the Presidio. So I'm always looking for those. <laughs> always on the lookout for mule understand. stories. Now I understand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all clear to me now. <laughs> and their names, like their names are just absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's Duke fantastic. Wellington, isn't that? That's a fantastic name for, for a mule. That's, that's really good. I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I think that's pro probably a good way to um, wind down that part of the uh, conversation here. Um, so if if everybody has something, we can talk about recommendations at this point. Uh, John, were you able to come up with something that you'd like to recommend? Uh, I can do a book, right? Go for it. Yes. Then yeah. Oh, um, so I'm going to plug, um, since it's related to the Presidio, well, Tangentially related to the Residio, it, it came up in mind, but it's more about military history of the U.S. and California. A biography came out uh, this this year uh, uh, called Courage Above All Things, General John Ellis Wool and the U.S. Military, 1812-1863. Um, it's by Harwood P. Hinton and Jerry Thompson. And um, yeah, that's uh, that, that that's his years of service, 1812, 1862. He was born before that. But he's probably the most um, significant, the most important army general you've never heard of. Um, John Elswa, I'm guessing most people haven't haven't heard of him. Um, and, and this is really the first full biography written about him. But it's very interesting simply because or interesting to me, um, simply because it is because it, because his career does span. War of 1812, and he has significant roles in the War of 1812, uh, the War of Mexico, and the Civil War, and then also has important roles, um, especially as an inspector general uh, in that period right after uh, the War of 1812, uh, and really helped to establish uh, a lot of the professionalism, early professionalism and control within the army. So it's just, it's one of those biographies that presents a very, that, that presents a period of time that you might not consider from that perspective um, uh, uh, of his life. Uh, and, and he is all over the place. He's also involved. Uh, yeah. And many, because of inspector general, he, you know, he's traveling around the country much more than other people. And then in the 18, in the 1850s, he's um, commanding general of the uh, department of the Pacific. I think I got the name right. So, so the army uh, unit, responsible for California and the West and also for the Presidio. So it's interesting to see that those army struggles in California in the 50s, and it's of course um, Indian Wars, but then also dealing with the fractious settlers and then also uh, filibusters, people you know, like William Walker, people who want to leave from San Francisco to go take over Mexico. So it's, uh, so his life touches on a lot of things and it's a very, it's a very well-written uh, biography. So I recommend that. Well, that sounds really cool. Jimmy, did you have anything to recommend? I do. So keeping with the Presidio theme, um, we've talked okay. about World War I at length. Um, we touched a little bit on World War II, um, and we mostly looked at kind of the, the positive impact that the Presidio has had, especially on treating returning, um, returning soldiers uh, during World War I. Uh, however, like all American history, we've done some great things and we've done some things that we should probably learn from. And one of those is uh, Japanese American incarceration. So um, the Presidio is actually pretty central to Japanese American incarceration during World War II. Um, I believe the, the order was um, for exclusion, civilian exclusion was issued from the Presidio. And John, you can correct me if I'm incorrect. But, um, <laughs> Is that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the official orders, yeah. Yes, the official orders. Um, so the Presidio had put together um, an exhibition about um, about Japanese-American incarceration, especially the Presidio's role in, um, in that event. And I know that it was scheduled to end in July, which was also, um, you know, many of those things have been shut down due to COVID, but there is still a virtual tour online that people um, can interact mm -hmm. with. So highly, uh, highly recommend that, especially if you want to continue looking into um, the role of the Presidio in American history and especially in the 20th century. 
Well, and if I, if I can interrupt with a quick plug, uh, we should say that the Officers Club exhibitions are open again to the public as of recently on weekends. So that exhibition is still there and um, you, you can go see it. Excellent. Great. And we should just plug the Presidio in general. Yeah, because yeah. It, yeah. It's not only these, <laughs> these pieces of history that we're talking about, but just, I mean, the trails going to the, um, the various uh, bunkers that are along the coastal trails and everything. It's just uh, not to mention, I mean, the views of Golden Gate Bridge um, and Alcatraz. I mean, the, the place is just, you could explore history or nature there for days and uh, not cover the same thing twice. Some very good real estate. Yeah. Uh All right. Uh, That sounds really cool. Um, I'm going to recommend um, a book also. Um, Like I I mentioned before, I'm uh, I'm originally from California and my hometown was Paradise, California, which was, uh, you know, it became famous in November 2018 when the wildfire came through and destroyed the entire town, uh, killing 80 some odd people. And uh, the right recommendation this week is a book uh, that just came out last month, actually. Uh, it's called Paradise, One Town Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire. Uh, that, you know, this is very, it's recent history in that, you know, the, the town burned down three years ago, but there, it's also does a pretty good job. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's written in more of a journalistic style than a, you know, an academic history style, but there is some context in there for lo- the longer kind of historical decisions that went into the construction of the town, the layout of roads and all of that, that ended up contributing to just how disastrous the uh, the wildfire was. And so it, there's a lot of talk about decisions that politicians made. There's decisions that just residents made. Um, it, it talks a bit about the uh, paradise was it re- very much a kind of a libertarian conservative type place where people go to get away from things like city services and sidewalks and stuff like that. And uh, when the fire broke out, uh, it turned into uh, quite a a nasty, um, you know, event. So it's a, it's, it's a grim book, but it's, uh, it's good. It's the first kind of journalistic, um, you know, book, book length publication on the fire and kind of what led up to it written by Lizzie Johnson, who works for the Washington Post at this point, but she used to work for the San Francisco Chronicle where she was reporting on all the various other wildfires that were happening in California history. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a grim, but it's also a very gripping read. It kind of focuses on specific people and how, what they witnessed and kind of does like almost a minute by minute kind of a, uh, just, a description of the fire and how do you how do you evacuate a town of thirty thousand people uh, when the, they only had like two hours of warning from when the fire first broke out, uh, you know, thirty miles away or so. I forget exactly how far it was, but um, but they only had two hours to to evacuate the entire town, and of course they failed miserably. And so it's it's kind of a uh, you know it's a grim kind of story on its own, but it also sets the stage for future disasters because California isn't going to stop burning anytime soon, and so we'll have to see. Hopefully, the the mistakes of paradise won't be replicated anywhere else, but we shall see. So, end on. yeah, <laughs> crap. California <laughs> won't stop burning anytime soon. Says <laughs> the person who escaped. Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, pe- people ask, are you going to go back to California? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> will, will California be there long term for you to come back to? <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> yes, I pol- apologies for ending on the grim note like that. <laughs> but um, thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, this was fantastic. And thank you all for joining us today. This episode appears on the Working Historians podcast feed, and you can subscribe to that feed on any podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Lyceum, SoundCloud, or whatever else you prefer. That way you won't miss any episodes, and you'll continue to hear about all the other cool stuff that historians do with their lives. If you have any questions or comments for this or any of our other podcasts, send us a message to workinghistorians at gmail.com or through our Twitter feed, at Work Historians. Leave us a review on iTunes if you feel like it. For Jimmy Fennessy and John Bertland, I'm Rob Denning. Happy start of the holiday season to you.